Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is absolutely infuriating. I can already tell you that you are going to be incredibly frustrated with this case. You are going to be angry and you're just going to want to scream. So, so many missteps were taken with this case and this death was absolutely one of the most preventable that I have ever encountered to this date. So, with that being said, let's just get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic murder of Connie Dadka. Connie Dadka was 45 years old when her life was taken from her. She was described as someone who was kind-hearted, vibrant, caring, and empathetic. Her friends described her as being a compassionate person who was overflowing with kindness. One friend said that if you were a friend of hers, she would do anything in her power to help you. She loved animals as she treated her two cats like they were her children. She also enjoyed fashion, sewing garments in her free time. She worked as a medical research assistant and a production manager for a decal manufacturer. She also volunteered her time at a local mental health outreach center. Connie lived alone in a condo in the Rancho Penasquito neighborhood in San Diego, California. This area is known as being a pretty nice community with a median income of over $100,000 per year. It's surrounded by other gated communities which have median incomes in the millions. So it's known as a very nice area that many people want to live in because of how nice and how safe it seems. However, that was not the case for Connie Dadka. By 8.26 a.m. on June 15th, 2022, police responded to a call from a concerned neighbor of Connie's who said that Connie may be dead inside of her condo. They arrived to her condo and by 8.30 a.m., first responders found her body she had been murdered. But the thing about this case is that it absolutely could have been prevented because as it turns out, police literally ignored 10 other calls that they received from neighbors who were all concerned for Connie's safety. By June 14th, 2022, so backing up just a little bit, at 6.59 p.m., a neighbor who had only been identified as Sally called 911 to report that she witnessed an angry man banging on Connie's door and screaming. The neighbor said that they were afraid for Connie's safety because of how erratic and upset this man was behaving at that time. Five minutes later, by 7.04 p.m., a second neighbor, a man this time, called 911 to report that an angry man was now yelling at a passerby. By 7.16, this time Sally's mother, so the mother of the neighbor who originally called 911, she called 911 to report that her daughter Sally is home alone and she is afraid of this angry man who is walking around the condo and yelling. So now, three separate people have called 911 over the course of 17 minutes, all reporting on the same man, yet no officer was dispatched to the scene. By 7.25 p.m., another neighbor called 911 to report that there was a man who was carrying around a bottle and pulling out an electrical box by Connie's condo. At 7.32, Sally called 911 again to report that the man is still in the area and he's still angry and he's still yelling. By 7.42 p.m., now Sally's father called 911 to report that once again, his daughter is at home alone and she is scared of this clearly erratic man who is in the area and is yelling. At that point, Sally's dad asked the police why no one had been dispatched, but I'm not exactly sure of the response at this time. We will get a lot more into what police have said about this later, but for now, let's keep going. By 7.51 p.m., Sally's mother calls 911 for the third time, again asking about the delay in an officer being dispatched. This time, she told the dispatcher that the man is still yelling and is still banging on Connie's door. By 8 p.m., about an hour after the first 911 call, Sally calls 911 again to tell them that she now saw this man break into Connie's condo and she can hear a loud physical altercation going on inside. She later recalls telling the dispatcher that this man looked and sounded so angry, 
so violent. She's never seen someone act this way before and she thought that he was going to kill Connie. At 8.02 p.m., another neighbor called Michelle called 911 to report that she too saw this man climb over a wall and over up into her balcony and then break the sliding glass door into Connie's condo and then break in. She said that she can see the man through the window after he broke the glass and forced his way in. By 8.05, Sally is still on her call with 911 and she now informs the officer that she believes the man actually had a weapon because she saw that there had been something in his pocket that he started waving around. By 8.08 p.m., yet another individual called 911 to report that he saw a man break a window and go inside of a condo, and this person believes that the man is still inside. By 8.40 p.m., Michelle calls 911 again to ask why the police have not responded yet, saying that the man is still inside of Connie's condo. By 8.41 p.m., officers are finally dispatched and start heading their way towards Connie's condo, where they arrive by 8.47 p.m., literally almost two hours after the original 911 call. At this time, police knock on the door, call her cell phone, and they look for her vehicle, but she didn't answer. So literally about 15 minutes later, police told dispatch that they were clearing the area because they couldn't make contact with Connie. So the officers informed dispatch that they didn't hear any noise inside or see any movements. They said that they didn't speak with any of the neighbors and they didn't hear any physical altercation going on inside. They looked around the area with a flashlight and saw that there was broken glass, but I guess this didn't really mean much to them. So they really didn't think that she was inside, I guess. So you want to know what they did? They left. They did absolutely nothing. So by 9.41 p.m., a half hour after the police left, Michelle called 911 again and demanded to speak with the officers who actually responded to the calls. She wanted to know why they didn't do anything to make their way inside of that condo. They literally stood outside, knocked on the door, looked around a little bit, and left. No one responded to her request until almost an hour later when at 10.32 p.m., one of the officers who responded finally called her back. So, this officer explained to Michelle that the description of the man from the callers matched a description of a man who they thought lived there. So, they assumed that he broke into his own home because he may have locked himself out. That was the explanation. But he didn't live there. Six entirely separate people all called 911 to report that a man was trying to break into their neighbor Connie's condo. They all very clearly stated that this man did not live there, that it was Connie's condo. And even beyond that, people were saying that he had a weapon. He was yelling. He was agitated. And he was even yelling at people, innocent people, passing by. And there was a loud physical altercation inside of that condo. So even if he did live there, even if he had rights to be on that property, which he didn't, but even if he did, something was going on inside. They literally said that there was two people in that condo and one person was attacking the other person, yet they didn't do anything about it. Then, as I stated before, by 8.30 a.m. that next day on Wednesday, June 15th, police arrived to Connie's condo to find her body. Connie was found wrapped in a blanket, almost nude, on the couch in her condo, and she was covered in blood. She had bruising around her neck and dried blood on her nose. There was blood splatter all over the walls, smeared blood on the floors, shards of glass on the floor, and the furniture was in complete disarray. An intense physical altercation had clearly taken place there. After her body was sent to the medical examiner, they determined that her cause of death was the result of multiple blunt force injuries, especially to her head. Of course, after finding her body, police first had to come up with their excuses as to how exactly they let this happen, because they did. They let this happen. Not only did they simply ignore the first 10 calls, but when they finally responded after almost two hours, they knocked on the door and left because they didn't get an answer. Why didn't they get an answer? 
most likely because Connie was busy being dead. So, police said that the initial calls from the neighbors were categorized as priority to calls. These calls include disturbances, trespassing, and things like that. They said that they typically try to respond to these calls within 27 minutes, though according to 2022 city data, they actually typically take around two hours to respond. About an hour after the initial call, when the neighbor called to report an actual break-in, this incident was upgraded to a priority one call. Priority one call include things like burglaries in progress, as well as felonies like child abuse and domestic abuse. They try to respond to these calls within 14 minutes, but the wait time is actually 40 minutes, which is in line with the response time after this call was upgraded to priority one. Lieutenant Steve Soblowski, who works with the department's homicide unit, said that no officer was dispatched within the first hour of the original calls because it seemed like a lower priority incident. Then they said that they were under the impression that the man lived in the condo that they were getting calls about even though they were told by the neighbors that he did not live there. They knew that there was a physical altercation inside and no one reported that they saw anybody leaving. So clearly something was going on inside and Connie didn't leave and neither did this man. But the police said, quote, when you're going to force entry into someone's home, that is the highest level of legal standard we operate under. So you have to be on point legally and tactically. Because if officers go in and make the wrong decision on a poor guy that left his keys in there and broke into his own home and a significant use of force, or God forbid, officers use deadly force, there is going to be a lot of hard questions asks of that supervisor and those officers. As we know, officers typically need a warrant to enter the home, but they are able to under extreme circumstances such as emergencies when someone's life is in danger. Law professors would later go on to say that there are circumstances where they have to be suspect about entering someone's home due to their risk of being sued. But in this case, everybody who has examined the case, law professors, everyone else who has looked into the details, everyone has agreed that they obviously had justifiable grounds to enter her condo and they absolutely should have. However, we would later find out that there was actually crucial information that the responding officers were not informed of. Like I said earlier, a neighbor called 911 to report that they had reason to believe that Connie was dead inside of her condo. Turned out that that morning, a man had left Connie's condo and had actually asked a neighbor to call 911 because his girlfriend was not breathing. This man was later identified as 44-year-old Parrish Chambers. But as you could probably guess, Parrish Chambers was not Connie's boyfriend, he was her stalker. So, Connie and Parrish had met two years prior in 2020 through an acquaintance. This acquaintance attended a group therapy session at the mental health center that Connie volunteered at. The two developed, I guess, a sort of friendship, one of Connie's best friends reported that the two had never dated. They never got past a friendship, but Parrish seemed to feel differently. He said that Parrish just sort of latched on to Connie and started stalking her. He would show up randomly at Connie's place uninvited and unannounced, and there were two incidents that we know of before the murder took place in particular that really scared Connie. Through all of the stalking and attacks, Connie had started to become really afraid of Parrish because there were multiple times when he would just show up to her condo and the two would end up getting into some sort of altercation. So first, on November 2nd, 2021, at around 1.30 a.m. that morning, Connie had gone to an ATM at a local shopping center in Mountain View, and at some point, Paris showed up and the two started arguing. Then, Paris started grabbing Connie by her hair and dragged her into her SUV and started driving away. There was actually a witness to this attack who actually recorded the audio on her phone where Connie could be heard screaming for help. This witness was able to capture some of what was said on video, but Parrish was very difficult to understand. Either way, it goes as follows. Connie, it's my car. I can look for it. Okay, he's in my car and he's, um, I have my purse in my car he's looking for. I don't know. Money. Um, whatever he needs. Um, he's in the driver's seat. And then Parrish is unintelligible in the background, 
Connie says, this is my car, man. Parish unintelligible once again. Connie, no, get out. Get out, psycho. I need my car. Get out. My God, what's wrong with you, man? I'm not your child. Get your own car. Then Connie called 911. From this call, we do have the transcripts and they start as follows. Connie says, hi, I need someone to send out, I think police. I had a friend of mine took my car from me. I'm in a parking lot without my purse. I don't have anything on me but my phone. He's, um, out of his mind. He's, um, he just pushed me in the passenger seat and, um, he pushed me and said that he's going to get the car and that he doesn't give a profanity and he just, uh, drove off. After that, Connie is trying to give the dispatcher her location and you can hear sounds of a heated confrontation start between her and Parrish where she repeatedly asks him to calm down. So, I believe he drove off, she calls 911 and then he comes back. So, after they start this altercation, she is heard yelling, no, don't, before she screams out in pain. Then, another witness came forward to say that he then witnessed the man and the woman arguing before he lunged at her and then pushed her and grabbed her and forced her into the car. By the time police got to the scene, though, they were both gone. The next day, they were able to make contact with Connie, who had a hard time telling them exactly what happened, so there were questions on whether there were drugs involved or something like that. For this incident, though, Parrish was not placed under arrest or charged with any crime associated with this attack. Then, back in April of 2022, officers were dispatched to Connie's condo to reports of a domestic dispute. Neighbors were called saying that Connie and Parrish would frequently fight once again, but on this occasion, the neighbor called in to say that they witnessed him put his hands around her neck in the hallway that leads to her condo. The neighbor was terrified at that point because she was convinced that he was about to kill Connie. When police responded to that call, they told dispatch that there were visible injuries on Connie. They reported that there was no prior relationship with Connie at any point, so there was no romantic involvement between the two of them, but Connie said that she didn't want to press charges. So, she was told to lock her doors and let police know if he ever came back. In that same report, the officers explicitly told the dispatcher that Chambers did not live at that address. He was given a court-ordered restraining order and instructed to stay away from Connie. So, the officers who responded to the calls in the evening of June 14th were given a record called a prior activity code or a PAC file. The information in this report, though, was heavily redacted, including the fact that he didn't live there, that she had physical injuries at this past incident, and that she didn't press charges. So, when police got the description of the man who matched the description of the person that they knew to be Parrish, who they thought lived there, they could easily have run his background check to see if there were ever any issues with Connie, and they would have seen that he had a court order to stay away from her. So, police knew who he was at the time of these 12 911 calls, and they literally just assumed that he lived there. It might have been from this PAC report that listed that there was a prior incident involving him at this address, but other than that, they had absolutely no information to make them think that he lived there, and in fact, they were told by neighbors that he didn't live there. And again, if they had just taken the short amount of time to run his background check, then they would have seen that he absolutely should not been at her home. He didn't live there, and not only that, but he was told to stay away from her. Either way, going back to the morning that police found her body. When Parrish told this neighbor that his girlfriend was not breathing, police arrived shortly later and found that Parrish was still there. When they found her body, they said that it was clear that she had been injured and killed, so Parrish was arrested right then and there. When he was arrested, he was found to have cuts and scratches all over his hands, injuries on his arms and legs, and he was carrying a bottle of vodka. When Chambers was questioned initially, he told the police that him and Connie were dating and that he would occasionally go to her condo to spend time with her. He said that he went to Connie's house at around 8 p.m. on the night of the 14th when he noticed that the sliding glass door had been shattered. He said that he asked Connie, who was still alive, about why the door had been shattered, but she wouldn't tell him why. 
She said that he tried to clean up the glass that was all over the ground, but he cut his hand when doing so. After that, he told the police that him and Connie had sex that night, then fell asleep on the couch while cuddling. Paris said that when he woke up the next morning on June 15th, he found that Connie wasn't moving and she felt cold and rigid to the touch. At that time, he said that he had no idea how she died because he noticed no visible injuries on her. He said that it took him a few minutes to realize that she had actually died. And at that time, he said the battery on his phone was dead, so that is why he flagged down a neighbor for them to call 911. However, police were able to find surveillance video from the condo that previous night that showed that Parrish had shown up to Connie's apartment, coming and going for an hour, and becoming increasingly agitated as the night went on. Then, another neighbor identified Chambers as the man that she saw that night getting agitated, yelling, kicking the door, and breaking it in. The neighbor said that she had seen the same behavior from Parrish many times before, where he would come uninvited, knock on the door, kick on it, and start yelling. She said that she was also the same neighbor who called 911 to report that incident back in April after she saw him fighting with Connie in the parking lot before grabbing Connie around the neck in the hallway by her condo. But the neighbor said that this time, he seemed even angrier than ever before. He was completely out of control this time, and this is the neighbor that saw him climb over the balcony and break in. So, like I said, Parrish was arrested at the scene. He was initially charged with her murder, but shortly after, other charges were added. They added two counts of battery, one of them being connected to the report of him strangling her at her condo months earlier. Then, as we know, they found her body to have injuries, so one count was related to that. Then, he was charged with a false imprisonment from the incident that took place back in November. To these charges, Parrish pleads not guilty, and as of right now, he is set to stand trial for these charges, but it's unclear when that trial is going to take place. It was originally scheduled for October of 2022, but I don't think it's started yet and I haven't heard anything else about when his trial is going to take place. So, as of right now, that is where the case is at. I know he has had some sort of preliminary hearing for these charges, but I don't know much beyond that. I don't think he's had the trial or accepted a plea deal for anything, and so I don't know when or if that will take place. But of course, I will keep you all updated as we find out more. But either way, I think it's pretty obvious what happened here. Obviously, it's all alleged until he gets his day in trial. But clearly, in my opinion, he felt entitled to Connie's attention and her affection. He felt that she was his to do with what he wanted. And when she didn't reciprocate that, he did what he wanted to her and murdered her. This case is probably one of the most frustrating yet in terms of how it was handled. We have talked a lot about egregious police responses in a lot of cases, but this is probably the worst that I've ever seen. The fact that they got call after call after call and simply ignored them, and then when they finally responded, they did nothing, it's absolutely disgusting. I definitely think that they could have and should have done a lot more to actually go inside. The sliding glass door was literally broken, so they could have just entered that way. Like, there's so many more things that they could have done, but instead of being focused on, like, trying to intervene in this clear domestic dispute where somebody was clearly being hurt per the reports of people that were literally hearing it, they were more worried about covering their own butts. They didn't want to get sued. They didn't want to get in trouble. I get that, you know, in a lot of places, especially big cities, police don't want to do anything wrong. They don't want to get themselves in trouble. They don't want to do anything that could possibly harm an innocent person, but at the same time, they clearly didn't have the information that they needed going into this situation. They clearly should have been told more. They clearly were not relayed the gravity of this situation because if they were, they would have known just how 
horrible of a situation this was and how urgently it needed to be addressed. This case is why I am such a strong advocate for personal protection. Many people say that citizens don't need firearms for personal protection because we have police or because, you know, you're just being paranoid and that these things don't happen to most people. I see those comments all of the time saying that, like, it's crazy that the U.S. is able to have weapons like, you know, guns and things like that and that, you know, there's no reason that anybody should ever need one. But to me, that's absolutely not true. To me, I will not rely on a single other person to keep me safe. Not my roommates, not my boyfriend, not the police. Only I have the sole responsibility to keep myself safe. I can't trust that anybody else will always have my best interest in mind, even though I obviously trust that they do. I hope that they do. I know that, you know, most people in my life will do what they can to protect me, but I also can't trust that they would act in my best interest in a life or death situation, but I can trust that I will. I cannot trust that the police will come and save me within the very short amount of time that it takes to kill someone. I was just talking about this case to one of my roommates and I was saying like, if someone broke into your house and they pointed a gun at you, what are the odds that they're just going to stand there for two hours while you call the police and sit on hold and wait until they get there? That's just not how these things work. To me, being trained in defending myself and trusting myself and only myself to protect myself is how I think, in my opinion, everybody should go about it. Yes, it's nice to have police to fall back on. If all else fails and you're trying to defend yourself and you just can't and things are going badly, you know that police should or hopefully will be there soon or if you have your friends that live with you you have roommates you have a significant other you know that there's another person on your side but at the end of the day the only person responsible for your personal safety is you not the government not your significant other not your spouse not your friends not your guard dog nobody else is responsible for your personal protection except you. Again, imagine a situation where someone comes into your house and they start attacking you, whether they're beating you or whatever they're doing to you, and you call the police and you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait and this person continues doing what they're doing to you and you wait and you wait and you wait and there's nobody coming. You don't have your own taser. You don't have a knife. You don't have anything by you that can help you. You live alone and as you're being attacked, you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait for two hours and nobody comes to help you. Imagine that. That is what Connie went through. She was being beaten and nobody was coming to help her. She was screaming. She was calling for help. She was doing what she could, but nobody was coming to help her. That is reason enough. This case is reason enough for me to say that every single woman out there, especially if you live alone, but even if you don't, every single woman out there should have some sort of weapon and or personal defense training. It's a stupid thing that we have to consider, but it's the world we live in. Whether you feel comfortable owning a gun or a taser or a knife or pepper spray, get whatever you can and train yourself until you feel comfortable with it. And it can make all the difference and it will make all of the difference if you find yourself in a situation like this one. Because again, we can say over and over and over again how police need to improve in their jobs. We can say that the police need more training, that they need this, they need that, they need more funding, they need whatever, they need more officers, they need more bodies, they need faster response times. Whatever you can say about that, nothing will ever change my mind in the fact that you need to be responsible for your own personal safety. And if you have children, you need to be responsible for theirs as well. If you're a parent and you have, you know, children or even if you have pets, I will not rely on the police to save any of my loved ones. I'm going to do that. Why? Because I care about them and the police don't. Again, it's their job to save them, but they do not care about my loved ones the way I do. They do not care about you or your loved ones the way that you do. So at the end of the day, only person that can save you from a situation is yourself and that is the only person that you should rely on to do that. So that is all I'm going to say about this. Again, this case is a perfect example of why women are so vulnerable and they need to do what they can to keep ourselves safe because at the end of the day, the only person that we can 100% rely on 100% of the time 
is ourselves. But with that, that is where I'm going to end today's video and now I want to hear what you all think about this. What do you think of the police's excuses for their delayed response? Do you think more could have or should have been done to prevent this situation from happening? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.